Hi, this is Kristen, and I'm going to finish talking about Blood Part 2, which relates to the Open Educational Resource Anatomy and Physiology textbook online. Just want to do a quick recap of how we stop bleeding. If we break a blood vessel, we initially uh, vasoconstrict the blood vessel. That's the vascular spasm, first step. The second step involves a positive feedback loop where platelets form a plug in the blood vessel wall to try to stop or slow bleeding. And then finally, coagulation is formation of a blood clot. And that step by itself can be divided up into three major phases. So with coagulation, fibrinogen, which is dissolved in blood plasma, comes out of solution and it's converted into fibrin which is no longer dissolved in blood plasma and it forms a, a mesh that traps red blood cells and platelets and that forms the blood clot. So let's look at, real quickly at the three phases of coagulation in hemostasis. Okay, so here are the three phases for coagulation. Coagulation is basically blood clotting, and it's a multi-step process where blood is transformed from a liquid to a gel. And the factors that promote blood clotting are called procoagulants or clotting factors. And anything that inhibits blood clot formation is called an anticoagulant. So um, the things that, that lead to this very first phase of coagulation is basically the formation of this molecule called prothrombin activator. So in order to get to that first phase um, of three, there are two possible pathways, and all of this is basically shown in green um, up above. Uh, so the first phase of coagulation is the formation of prothrombin activator, which is basically just a blood clotting factor. The second phase is conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, and the third phase is the formation of the, the fibrin mesh, which makes up the actual blood clot. And the formation of the fibrin mesh occurs from converting, well, it basically occurs from converting fibrinogen into fibrin in the blood plasma. So if we look at the two pathways that allow the formation of the prothrombin activator clotting factor, the intrinsic pathway is shown on the left. And it's named intrinsic because all the factors necessary to form the prothrombin activator are present within the blood. This is a slower clotting pathway and it can be triggered by negatively charged surfaces like platelets that have been activated plus collagen or glass. So for example, the glass of a test tube. That in itself um, could be you can form blood clots in glass because all of the factors within the blood are present in order to do that. Activation of the second pathway, the extrinsic pathway, requires that blood be exposed to something called tissue factor. So the extrinsic pathway is triggered through an endothelium derived protein factor called tissue factor or factor 3 and it occurs really rapidly like within 15 seconds. So basically tissue factor tissue factor whoops I lost my place hold on Okay, so the tissue factor is actually found within the, the walls of the blood vessel. So endothelium is the smooth tissue that lines the blood vessels. And once you rupture that blood vessel, this tissue factor becomes exposed. And so 
it's called the et extrinsic pathway because the the clotting factor isn't really within the blood it's actually within the blood vessel wall and so it's extrinsic to the blood or outside the blood and uh, once it doesn't usually both pathways occur in order to ultimately create this prothrombin activator which is shown at the bottom in yellow okay if we look at the next phase phase two phase two basically shows how uh, prothrombin two is converted into thrombin and thrombin is really important because it catalyzes the reactions that convert that soluble fibrinogen, that fiber that's dissolved in the plasma, into fibrin, which is when it, the fiber comes out of solution. And that, that I just mentioned, is the final step. When thrombin catalyzes the reaction that converts fibrinogen into fibrin, and fibrin make up the actual strands of the blood clot. So if we ever had a loss of fibrinogen in the blood plasma, that would lead to an inability to form blood clots. And there's a, a picture of the blood clot right here. And you can see the fibrin strands that are trapping the red blood cells, the platelets, to form the blood clot. So what is clot retraction? Clot retraction is basically a, where these little contractile proti, the platelets, contract and they pull the fibrin strands of the blood clot and that squeeze in the clot and it actually pulls tissue edges together. So the damaged blood vessel get pulled together so the gap is eliminated. And that is called clot retraction. Repair of the actual stimulated by a substance that's in the platelet. It's called platelet-derived growth factor, EGF. It's released by the it's to rebuilding of the vessel wall. And then the third stage is lysis. Lysis means to, so fibrinolysis is splitting or splitting of the blood clot. Fibrin removes clots. It basically removes unneeds through the action of the, this fibrin diagram called plasmin. So plasmin is the enzyme that runs. And fibrinolysis usually be two days and it can continue for several days until the clot is completely dissolved. Plasminogen, which is a plasma protein, converted to plasmin in order to remove these unneeded clots. You don't want to, they're no longer serving a purpose because that would increase a person's risk for heart attack and stroke. So what factors can possibly limit of clots as they form? Well, one thing that does is that rapidly moving blood will dilute factors before they can initiate or start cutting cascade. And so um, also we have, we have substances that can inactivate clots well. Both of those things help uh, limit the ultimate side clot. And that's um, otherwise we might have clots too big. We, we wouldn't want to clot the entire vasculature system forming, right? So there are some things that can help limit that. One is that thrombin that isn't already bound to the clot can enter the gen and be inactivated by an anti called antithrombin 3 as well as protein and heparin. And thrombin, thrombin which we saw just a moment ago here, uh, basically thrombin is responsible for converting that soluble fiber into the insoluble fiber that's the last step blood clot and so anything that's not actually anything that's not actually um, can or attached to the blood clot any of that can get um, 
basically washed away the river of this general blood flow and that dilutes, dilutes the clotting factors. Another thing that prevents the formation of large clots is just having a very smooth interior of the blood vessel wall. So the inside of the blood vessel is called the intima because it's in intimate contact with the blood and it's a it's an endothelium tissue and it's extremely smooth when it's healthy. If it's smooth and intact, platelets are prevented from clotting. Now one of the things that can happen that leads to atherosclerosis or hardening and narrowing of the arteries is when the inner lining of the blood vessel walls becomes insulted or roughened up by high blood pressure or plaques from high lipids within the blood that build up on the walls. And that sort of thing um, can lead to blood clotting. So ideally we want to have a real smooth vascular endothelium in contact with the blood. So what are some of the disorders of blood of stopping bleeding. Disorders of hemostasis implies disorders related to um, an inability to stop bleeding. So there are two major types of thromboembolytic disorders and one of them is a thrombus and the other one is an embolus. So thromboembolytic disorders result from conditions that cause undesirable clotting such as roughening of the vessel in endothelium or slow flowing blood or blood flow stopping altogether. So a clot that forms and persists in an unbroken vessel is called a thrombus. And if it's large enough it can block blood flow to tissues. And when that happens the tissues downstream begin to die because they typically rely on oxygen being present in the blood. A thrombus that breaks away from a vessel wall is called an embolus. And an embolus or a blood clot that's caught up in the flow of the blood usually becomes lodged further downstream in a vessel that has a smaller diameter and that restricts blood flow. So an embolus is a blood clot and a thrombus is a blood clot that breaks away and flows and gets caught somewhere else. So an embolus obstructs a blood vessel and sometimes people who are at risk for developing embolisms might be prescribed um, an injectable heparin or they might take a blood thinner such as aspirin. Um, but the risk factors associated with a, a predisposition to form blood clots would be things or like atherosclerosis, inflammation, and slow flowing blood. So anticoagulant drugs or drugs that help prevent blood clotting are things like aspirin, heparin, and warfarin and they're just used clinically to prevent undesirable clotting. Blood disorders that arise from abnormalities that prevent normal clot formation are dangerous because they can lead to somebody bleeding to death. Thrombocytopenia is a deficiency in circulating platelets and that can result from any condition that suppresses or destroys red bone marrow. And coincidentally, my almost 11 year old Siberian Husky is suffering from critical thrombocytopenia today. He's in, he's at the veterinary clinic. He's been there all day and basically he has a very low um, circulating platelet count which would uh, prevent him from being able to stop bleeding and so we're trying to get to the bottom of it right now but I, I find it kind of uh, ironic that he's suffering from a bleeding disorder when I'm teaching you about it right now. Um, we're not really sure if he was exposed to uh, uh, rodenticide, which would be like a rat poison, which we don't have at our house, but you know it's possible he could have gotten into that. Or if he was exposed to a, 
a tick and there's a tick-borne illness or perhaps a bacterial infection of some sort, um, hopefully we'll find out. Um, back to the bleeding disorders. So thrombocytopenia can lead to an inability to form blood clots. Also impaired liver function. Um, that can lead to a difficulty in forming blood clots and stopping bleeding because that would result in a lack of synthesis of clotting factors. Um, and if you don't have clotting factors, you can't form blood clots. This can happen from a shortage of vitamin K, and that can happen with um, cirrhosis of the liver or hepatitis because liver um, is involved in that process. And that's another thing we were thinking of with my dog is that is there some kind of issue with his liver? He also had a real high bilirubin um, content. Um, hemophilia is another disease that interferes with the ability to stop bleeding by forming blood clots. And this is a genetic condition and it results in a deficiency of, oh, whoops, it results in a deficiency of, um, in a deficiency of, uh, clotting factors, specifically clotting factors 8, 9, and 11. Factor 8 is anti-hemophiliac factor. Uh, diagnostic blood tests. Uh, oh shoot, I have to, before we get to diagnostic blood tests, I actually have one other bleeding disorder I forgot to mention. It's called disseminated intravascular coagulation. And it's something that can be a result of septicemia, which is uh, when you have infection in the blood, or it can happen from an incompatible blood transfusion, or even as a complication of pregnancy. But it's, it's severe in that it leads to this widespread blood clotting, yet also severe bleeding. So disseminated intravascular coagulation is, is uh, um, something a person would want to avoid for sure. Okay, diagnostic blood tests. Well, diagnostic blood tests are usually used to give some insight into a patient's health. And sometimes just changes in some of the visual properties of blood can signal diseases like anemia if a person has a low hemoglobin or a red blood cell count or a low, low hematocrit, which would be a low red blood cell percentage. Um, it can also, it might, some of the visual properties of blood could potentially signal heart disease or diabetes or infections. So we use blood tests to try to signal the possibility of these diseases. There's one blood test called the differential white blood cell count. And that's used to detect differences in relative amounts of specific blood cell types. So for example, you might take a look at um, how much of a specific type of white blood cell there is. Or um, another one is prothrom prothrombin time. Prothrombin time is a test that measures the amount of prothrombin in the blood. Um, which, of course, we just talked about how prothrombin is involved in blood clotting. Um, platelet counts, they also evaluate the status of the hemostasis system. And in hemostasis, again, that system is the ability to stop bleeding. And then a comprehensive medical panel, a CMP, and a complete blood count, or a CBC, those are often done because they give a great deal of information and they give overall values of the condition of the blood. Um, let's see. Also, uh, a couple things that I, I haven't really mentioned much in the past, but just wanted to talk real briefly about developmental aspects of the blood. Um, prior to birth, most of the blood cell formation occurs within the fetal yolk sac, which we will discuss in the third term.
um, when we discuss development in the womb. Um, blood cell formation also occurs in the liver and the spleen prior to birth. However, by about, by, by about the seventh month of fetal development before birth, red bone marrow becomes the primary site of hematopoiesis or blood cell formation. And after the seventh month, it remains as the prim primary site. It re remains as the site of hematopoiesis, the red bone marrow. Um, another interesting fact about development of the blood is that fetal blood cells form a different kind of hemoglobin than we would have as adults. Hemoglobin F has a higher affinity or attraction to oxygen than adult hemoglobin, which is known as hemoglobin A. So uh, fetal hemoglobin is going to have a, a stronger attraction to oxygen than um, an adult hemoglobin molecule would have. Um, a couple other major points just to review from our talk of blood typing and blood groups, and we basically did this in a lab, but I was just going to say that typically when, when blood is transfused and transferred from one person to another, usually they use packed red blood cells instead of whole blood. They typically only use whole blood in a blood transfusion when blood loss is very substantial or when they're treating thrombocytopenia, which is that low platelet count. Um, there are maybe 30 groups of red blood cell antigens that actually occur in humans, but, but typically we just use the ABO and the RH blood types because the ABO and RH antigens are the ones that can cause the really strong transfusion reactions that can be dangerous to a patient. So we already discussed antigens also known as agglutinogens and how um, they are found on the red blood cell membranes and the different blood types are based on the specific antigens on the red blood cells. The ABO blood types are based on the presence or absence of two types of heritable antigens, also known as agglutinogens. One antigen would be type A, another would be type B, but the type O group doesn't have type A or type B antigen. The preformed antibodies, also known as agglutin, are present in the blood plasma and are of the opposite to the individual's blood. So, for example, since B blood has both A and B, it's going to have no antibodies and no anti-B antibodies. Um, the RH factor is, includes a group of red blood cell antibodies that are either going to be present in blood or absent in RH negative blood. So, RH antibodies in RH negative in individuals only been first exposed to the RH antigen. For example, thinking about the the woman with RH negative, if her mate, if, her, uh, if the father of their child that's about has positive blood type, there's a possibility to have a positive blood type. If she had a blood type, it shouldn't be an issue because the mother's blood does not mix with the fetal blood during that during the gestation. However, if this is her first during childbirth, next, and at that point the mother will start to develop anti-RH antibodies. And so if she has any babies in the future, the RH antigen, she will have developed and begun producing these RH antibodies. And at that point she would be given to uh, basically to neutralize her anti-RH antibodies, and that's for the safety of the newborn. So a transfusion reaction occurs if the in the donor blood type are attacked by the blood plasma antibodies. Happens, it results in agglutination, which is known as clump, and it also results in hemolysis or of the donor's blood cells. Um, o blood is the universal donor type, and that's because it has no antigens and 
the A is the universal, and it has neither A, anti-A, nor antibodies in the blood plasma, so it can potentially receive any ABO blood type without having those antibodies. Again, AB blood group is the universal recipient. Blood typing, it's really important. The testing before any possible transfusion so it involves determination of possible transfusion reaction. A transfusion can occur between the donor and the recipient blood types. And uh, that's just kind of a quick review. Okay. Okay. Um, and I kind of forgot to... I was just kind of talking and I didn't really show these these slides, although we pretty much already did all this in the lab. Um, last thing I wanted to mention was that if a person has really low blood volume, they will be given blood volume expanders. And blood volume expanders can include usually isotonic salt solutions. So in other words, the solution that's given to the patient has the same osmolality as the blood. One example would be Ringer's solution because it mimics the normal electrolyte concentrations of the blood plasma. Um, plasma expanders are good because they mimic the osmotic properties of albumin in the blood, which basically means that they have the ability to still draw in water into the blood vessels, much like albumin and other plasma proteins would. However, the unfortunate part of plasma expanders is that they can't replace the oxygen carrying properties of hemoglobin. So, um, in other words, they're not going to improve the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Um, the preferred choice for restoring blood volume is usually just normal saline. So anyway, I didn't go through the slides as I was talking. Um, however, uh, Yeah, so that's really all I have to say. I basically just cleared up the major phases of coagulation that occur as the third step of blood clotting, or I mean hemostasis. So we went through the three steps of hemostasis and focused in on the third, which is coagulation or actual blood clotting. And then we uh, discussed clot retraction and removal, what can limit the, the size of the clot, a couple disorders involving the inability to stop bleeding, um, and a little bit about a couple major blood tests and when they might use, be used a couple points about development, developmental aspects of blood, and then just a quick review of blood typing. And that's basically what we covered. I'm going to go ahead and stop.